Human brain is a highly complex structure. It is a jungle of neurons containing billions of neurons wired through trillions of connections. Each part of the brain has a distinct set of functions and damage to a part of brain results in characteristic clinical manifestations. Knowledge of these clinical manifestations is of paramount importance in localization of a neurological lien. I am Dr. Mohammad Zaman, Assistant Professor at the Department of Medicine, Alama Iqbal Medical College, Lahore. For some medical students, localization of a neurological lien in exams is the worst nightmare. I will walk with you through this jungle of neurons and show you an easy way to localize a neurological lien. In order to decode a neurological diagnosis, we need to answer three basic questions. And those are, what is the lien, where is the lien, and why is the lien? Let me introduce Danish. Hi, Danish. Hi. Danish is a final year medical student. And in fact, he is going to localize a neurological lien, and I'm going to help him. So Danish, in order to localize a neurological lien, what is it that you are going to need? We are going to need a brief overview of the neuroanatomy, the concept and differences of the upper and lower motor neurons, the various patterns of motor weaknesses like hemiplegia and paraplegia. Thanks, Anish. So, in this brief video, we'll go through these topics and discuss a number of case scenarios. So, let us begin with basic neuroanatomy. Nervous system is divided into central and peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system comprises of brain and spinal cord, while peripheral nervous system consists of cranial and spinal nerves. Brain consists of cerebral hemispheres, brain stem and cerebellum. Cerebral cortex is a convoluted structure curved upon itself it consists of multiple tortuous folds called gyri separated by deep grooves called sulci. On the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere, there are two important sulci that make important anatomical landmarks. And these are central sulcus and lateral sulcus also called sylvian fissure. Central sulcus divides frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, while the lateral sulcus marks the upper boundary of temporal lobe. Occipital lobe is separated from other lobes through an arbitrary line. This gyrus in front of the central sulcus is called precentral gyrus and it serves as primary motor cortex. This is the command and control center for voluntary movements. If we look at the cross section of the cerebral hemispheres, you will notice a darker outer layer called gray matter and inner lighter area called white matter. Gray matter primarily consists of neuronal cell bodies while white matter is made up of myelinated axons of these neurons. If we look microscopically at the cerebral hemisphere outer layer, you will find different types of neurons arranged into six different layers. And can you see this tiny 
beautiful pyramidal cell in layer 5 of cerebral cortex. This neuron is the boss here because he controls lower motor neurons. These pyramidal cells send their exons all the way down to brain stem and spinal cord, innervate lower motor neurons there and tell them when to fire. These lower motor neurons in the, in the brain stem or in the spinal cord in turn innervate skeletal muscles and cause their contraction. These neurons, these pyramidal cells in layer 5 of the cerebral cortex are called upper motor neurons. The distribution of hundreds of thousands of these pyramidal cells is not random, rather it follows a unique topographic distribution. Pyramidal cells innervating lower motor neurons for lower limb are located on the medial surface while pyramidal cells innervating lower motor neurons for the upper limb are located on the lateral surface. This topographic distribution has important implications in localization of neurological lien. Uh, on the lateral surface of the dominant frontal lobe, which is the left frontal lobe in most of the individuals, there is an area called Broca's area or motor speech area and other area at the junction of parietal and temporal lobes is concerned with the analysis of sensory input related to speech and this is called Wernick's area. Cerebral hemispheres are connected to brain stem through cerebral peduncles. Brain stem has three parts and these are midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. A number of cranial nerves leave brain stem and uh, a third and fourth cranial nerves leave midbrain while fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth cranial nerves leave pons. Last four cranial nerves leave medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata passes through foramen magnum and continues as spinal cord. Spinal cord has 31 segments. So there are 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 1 coccygeal spinal segment. If we look at the cross section of the spinal cord, you can see that inner gray matter contains neuronal cell bodies while the outer white matter contains myelinated axons that constitute both ascending and descending tracts. Anterior horn cells located in the anterior horn of the gray matter, they constitute lower motor neurons, they leave the spinal cord, pass through the peripheral nerves and innervate skeletal muscles. The lower motor neuron supply of upper limb comes through C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1 spinal segments through brachial plexus while lower motor neuron supply of lower limbs comes through L1, L2, L3 and L4 spinal segments through lumbar plexus. Now we will discuss in greater details the concepts of upper and lower motor neurons. As you know that pyramidal cells of cerebral cortex are the upper motor neurons and their axons make two important descending tracts and these are corticobulbar and corticospinal tract. Corticobulbar fibers innervate cranial motor nuclei while corticospinal fibers innervate spinal motor nuclei. So the corticospinal tract uh, if we discuss in greater detail, the pyramidal cells send their axons all the way from cerebral cortex to the spinal cord through corona radiata, posterior limb of the internal capsule, cerebral peduncle, midbrain, pons and medulla. But to make things complicated, 
and a bit tricky for medical students, these fibers take a sharp turn at the level of lower medulla. They cross the midline, go to the other side and then descend in the spinal cord as lateral corticospinal tract. So that means that right-sided pyramidal fiber, uh, neurons will innervate left-sided spinal motor nuclei. So there is only the spinal nuclei get their innervation only from one side and that is the contralateral side. On the other hand, cranial motor nuclei, they get their innervation through corticobulbar fibers. But since cranial nuclei are higher up in the hierarchy, they are, they are rich, they are affluent, they are privileged. So unlike spinal motor nuclei, they get their upper motor innervation from both sides, which means that one cranial motor nucleus will get its upper motor neuron supply from both right and left side. So if there is damage to one-sided corticobulbar fibers, uh, a cranial motor nucleus will still get its upper motor innervation from the other side. But there is one exception and that makes all the difference in localization of neurological lien. And that different nucleus is the nucleus of facial nerve. So facial nucleus is a hybrid. Think of a centaur in Greek mythology that has a human head on horse torso. So facial nucleus also has two parts. The upper half of the facial nucleus is like all other cranial motor nuclei that get their innervation from both sides. While the lower half of the facial nucleus is like other spinal nuclei that get their innervation only from one side and that is the contralateral side. So think about right facial nucleus. The upper part of the right facial nucleus that innervates frontalis muscle gets it, its corticobulbar supply from both sides while lower half of the right facial nucleus that innervates lower half of the face gets its innervation only from the left side. So only the left corticobulbar tract innervates lower half of the facial nucleus. We will shortly discuss the implications of this anatomical uh, phenomenon. Lower motor neurons are the neurons that innervate skeletal muscles. So skeletal muscles of head and neck region are innervated by lower motor neurons located in the brain stem or cranial motor nuclei. And skeletal muscles of upper and lower limb are innervated by lower motor neurons located in anterior horns of spinal cord. So these lower motor nuclei send their or neurons send their exons through spinal roots to spinal nerves, plexus like brachial plexus in upper limb and lumbar plexus in lower limb and then form peripheral nerves that innervate group of skeletal muscles. So nerve fibers in these peripheral nerves innervate skeletal muscles through neuromuscular junction. So damage to these lower motor neurons right from their origin from the spinal cord in case of spinal nerves to the distal end of the axons can lead to lower motor neuron type weakness. So the different categories of lower motor neuron type weakness include myelopathy which is a disease of the spinal cord right at the level of anterior horn cells, radiculopathy which is the disease of nerve roots plexopathy which is a lesion at the level of plexus or neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy which is a lesion at the level of peripheral nerves. Before we embark upon the detailed discussion on motor weakness, let us briefly discuss uh, sensory system and the ascending pathways. Pain 
and temperature sensations are carried through spinothalamic tract while fine touch, vibration and proprioception are carried through dorsal column tract. There are some general rules that apply to sensory system. There are three orders of neurons in our sensory pathways. First order neurons are peripherally located. So for both spinothalamic tract and dorsal column tract, first order neurons are located in dorsal root ganglion. The second rule is that second order neurons always cross the midline. So for spinothalamic tract, the second order neurons are located right in the spinal cord in the dorsal root or dorsal horn of the gray matter. So these first order neurons innervate with these second order neurons in the spinal cord and axons of these second order neurons then ascend a few segments up and then cross the midline to go on to the other side and continue as lateral spinothalamic tract. And third order neurons of the spinothalamic tract are located in the thalamus. The second order neurons for the dorsal column tract on the other side are located in the brain stem in medulla. So what happens that these first order neurons they ascend in the spinal cord on the same side as dorsal column tract or as fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus until they reach to the lower level of the medulla where there are two important nuclei nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. So neurons in these two nuclei form second order neurons and then axons of these neurons cross the midline go to the other side and then ascend as medial lemniscal pathway. Again the third order neurons of this pathway are located in the thalamus. So now you can understand that if there is damage to right spinothalamic tract there will be loss of pain and temperature sensation on the left side while if there is damage to right dorsal column tract there will be loss of vibration and proprioception sensation on the same side on the right side. Now we'll, uh, this was the brief overview of the neuroanatomy and the ascending and descending pathways and we'll go in further details of hemiplegia and paraplegia. In cases of motor weakness the first question that we need to address is whether it's a lower motor neuron type weakness or an upper motor neuron type weakness. And this is what we do by performing the examination of motor system of a patient. So let us ask Danish what are the components of examination of motor system. We observe the muscle bulk and look for the signs of muscle wasting and spontaneous muscle twitching. We check the tone of the muscle and also check the power of various muscle groups. We elicit the deep tendon reflexes and the plantar reflex. And in the end we look for the coordination and the gait of the patient. So on the basis of these examination findings we differentiate whether it's a lower motor neuron type weakness or upper motor neuron type weakness. As you know that lower motor neurons maintain the growth of muscles by induced contractions as well as release of trophic factors that cause synthesis of proteins in the muscles. So in case of a lower motor neuron type weakness there is denervation atrophy. So early wasting is a feature of lower motor neuron type weakness. On the other hand, in upper motor neuron type weakness, since lower motor neurons are intact, so wasting is not a common feature of this type of weakness, except in cases of advanced disease where the patient may develop disuse atrophy. In cases of lower motor neuron type weakness, the denervated muscles become hyperexcitable and the spontaneous discharge from a single myofibril can be detected by electromyography as fibrillations. These are not visible to naked eye. 
but spontaneous contraction of an entire motor unit which consists of about 100 to 200 myofibrils innervated by a single neuron can result in visible twitching of the muscle which is called fasciculations and these can be seen by naked eye. So fibrillations which are seen on EMG or fasciculations that are visible by naked eye are seen in cases of low motor neuron type weakness but not in cases of an upper motor neuron type weakness. Muscle tone is decreased in cases of low motor neuron type weakness and this is called hypotonia and it is increased in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness and this is called hypertonia. In cases of a corticospinal tract or a pyramidal tract lien, the, the, the hypertonia is of a particular type. It is velocity dependent, it's more initially against the resistance and then suddenly decreases. And this type of hypertonia is called class I type of spasticity. After looking for tone, we go on checking deep tendon reflexes. Deep tendon reflexes are diminished or may be absent in cases of lower motor neuron type weakness and they are exaggerated in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness. Clonus is actually a hyper exaggerated deep tendon reflex and seen in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness. We also check for the plantar reflex by stroking along the lateral border of sole of foot. A normal response is that big toe goes down but in cases of an upper motor neuron weakness there, there is a positive Babinski response which is big toe goes up and other toes fan out. Please keep in mind that in cases of acute upper motor neuron type weakness these classical signs of upmotor neuron weakness may not be seen and the only useful clue in these cases may be an upgoing planter. So coming back to three basic questions that we answer by localization of a neurological lien, the first question was what is the lien? So in cases of a motor weakness we need to identify whether it is pure motor weakness or it is mixed motor and sensory weakness. What is the pattern of weakness? Is it upper motor neuron type or lower motor neuron type? What is the distribution of weakness? Whether it is weakness of one limb which is called monoplegia, whether it is weakness of both lower limbs called paraplegia or it is weakness of one half of the body for example right upper and right lower limb called hemiplegia. Then again on the basis of the severity of weakness we can call it as paresis when there is partial weakness or plegia when there is complete paralysis. So the, the first question what is the lien addresses these components of motor weakness. And then after answering this question we can move to the next question and that is where is the lien and with the concept of brief neuroanatomy in your mind then you can further localize the lien. So let us discuss various examples. You are asked to examine a male who has presented with weakness of both lower limbs and you find that there is muscle wasting, there is hypotonia, deep tendon reflexes are absent, both planters are down going. So on the basis of these examination findings, what do you think? What is the type of weakness? It is a lower motor neuron type of paraplegia. And where is the lesion? The lesion can be at the level of the lumbar spinal cord, the lumbar sacral nerve roots, lumbar plexus or the peripheral so nerve. Yes, it is lower motor neuron type paraplegia and lesion it can be a myelopathy which is a spinal cord disease. And if it is a myelopathy, it has to involve the lumbar segment of the spinal cord where these lower motor neurons are located. It can be radiculopathy, but generally radiculopathy is asymmetrical and it is painful. There can be plexopathy which is involvement of lumbar, lumbar or lumbosacral plexus and it can be a peripheral neuropathy. And one example, common example is acute Guillain-Barré syndrome or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. 
So what is the difference between neuropathy and myopathy? In cases of neuropathy, the weakness is primarily, it involves distal group of muscles. Myopathy generally involves muscles of proximal muscles, muscles of pectoral and hip girdle. In cases of neuropathy, deep tendon reflexes are absent, but in cases of myopathy, generally deep tendon reflexes are preserved, except in very advanced cases, there may be contracture formation and then deep tendon reflexes may be absent. Another important point is that in case of mixed polyneuropathy, in addition to motor weakness, there would be sensory deficit as well, which is not seen in cases of myopathy. So here is another patient who has presented again with weakness of both lower limbs, but this time uh, there is no wasting, tone is increased, deep tendon reflexes are exaggerated and planters are upgoing. So Danish, what is the lien? Upper motor neuron type paraplegia or spastic paraplegia. And where is the lien? Since the low motor neuron supply of the lower limbs comes from the lumbar spinal cord. So in this case of the upper motor neuron lesion, the lesion has to be above the level of this lumbar spinal cord. Yes, it can be. So it's, it has to be above lumbar spinal cord, which means it can be at the level of thoracic spinal cord or it, in case of upper limb weakness in, as well, it can be cervical spinal cord. So if there is no weakness of upper limbs and isolated weakness of lower limb, that means cervical spinal cord is intact. So it has to be somewhere between the cervical and lumbar spinal cord, which is the thoracic cord. So uh, how can we further pinpoint the site of lien? We check for the sensory deficit. Topmost level of the dermatomal sensory loss will localize the lesion. Yes, and you should remember a few important dermatological landmarks. The symphysis pubis, if there is sensory loss till the level of symphysis pubis, it's T12. If it's at the level of umbilicus, it is T10. Ziphi sternum marks T6. And uh, the memory gland or nipples mark the T4 level. So suppose in this case, along with spastic paraplegia, there is a sharp sensory level at the level of umbilicus. This means that lien is at T10 spinal segment. But which disease presents like this? So it is um, a myelopathy and myelopathy is broadly categorized into non-compressive and compressive myelopathy. An example of non-compressive myelopathy is transverse myelitis and there are many causes of transverse myelitis. And compressive myelopathy results from compression of the spinal cord that can be from the outside or that can be from within. Examples of compression from outside include a number of vertebral diseases like vertebral compression fractures, vertebral metastasis, vertebral osteomyelitis, a tumor from the meninges that are compressing the uh, spinal cord, a subdural hematoma or subdural abscess and then compression can be from within for example in case of stringomyelia where there is cavity formation causing compression of different tracts in the spinal cord. And this concludes uh, the discussion of paraplegia and now we will take the examples of hemiplegia and try to localize the lien. Hemiplegia results from unilateral damage to corticospinal tract and this damage can be at the level of brain stem, internal capsule or cerebral cortex. Since corticospinal tract crosses midline, midline at the level of lower medulla, so a damage to corticospinal tract in brain stem, internal capsule or cerebral cortex will result in hemiplegia on the contralateral side. So let us take an example in which a person has right sided hemiplegia and lien can be at the level of left brain stem, left internal capsule or left cerebral cortex and we will discuss these one by one. 
Uh, one important point in localizing glion at the level of brain stem is to look for involvement of any cranial nerve. In case of a left medullary lesion, in addition to right sided hemiplegia, there can also be a left hypoglossal weakness. And in case of hypoglossal weakness, there is deviation of tongue to the same side. And since deviation of tongue tells you about the side of the hypoglossal weakness, it is said that tongue never lies, which is perhaps the biggest lie. So if a person has left hypoglossal weakness and right sided hemiplegia, this localizes lesion to the level of left medulla. In cases of left pontine lesions, there, there would be right sided hemiplegia, but also there will be involvement of sixth or seventh cranial nerve. So the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve, innervates the half side of the face. And in case of a nuclear lien, there will be lower motor neuron type facial weakness, which means complete weakness of one half of the face. There would be no sparing or wrinkling of forehead. So if you have right sided hemiplegia and left facial weakness of lower motor neuron type, this localizes lien to the left bones. In case of a midbrain lien, there is involvement of other cranial nerve. Uh, like third nerve which is oculomotor nerve. So again there would be right sided hemiplegia and left sided third nerve palsy which will result in left sided extraocular ophthalmoplegia. But in addition to these two findings there is also involvement of left corticobulbar tract and as you can recall from your knowledge of neuroanatomy that all cranial nuclei get innervation from both sides except for the facial nucleus because that's a hybrid nucleus and its lower half gets upper motor neurons by only from the contralateral side. So this means that a left corticobulbar lesion will result in right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type in which case there would be weakness on involving lower half of the face with sparing of wrinkling of forehead. So if you get a right sided hemiplegia, right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type and a left third nerve palsy, this left third nerve palsy localizes lesion to uh, midbrain. So if you, and this is called Weber syndrome. So if you look at the brain stem lesions, you will find that there is hemiplegia on one side and a nuclear weakness on or bulbar weakness or nuclear weakness on the other side. So since the weakness has crossed the midline, this type of hemiplegia is called crossed hemiplegia. So whenever you come across a case of crossed hemiplegia, that means the lien is in the brain stem. Now after considering brainstem lesions, we will now look at what happens in case of internal capsule and cerebral cortex lesions. In case of a left uh, internal capsule lesion, there will be right sided hemiplegia and because there is also involvement of left sided corticobulbar fibers, you will also find a right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type. Now you have right sided hemiplegia and right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type. Now the weakness has not crossed the midline and this is called uncrossed hemiplegia. In cases of internal capsule lesion because there is there are a large number of fibers in small area in a limited space in cases of internal capsule lesions there is dense hemiplegia. How do we differentiate? internal capsule lesions from the cortical lesions we differentiate on the basis of presence of cortical dysfunction. So uh, again in cases of cortical disease there will be right sided uncrossed hemiplegia that is right facial weakness of upper motor neuron type and right hemiplegia but in addition there will be some cortical dysfunction. Uh, as you can recall from your knowledge of neuroanatomy 
that Boca's area which is motor speech area is located in left frontal lobe in most of the individuals. So with right sided hemiplegia if, if there is involvement of Boca's area as well patient will also have motor aphasia. If after discussing this part we can further identify in case of cerebral cortex involvement which vascular territory is involved. If you recall from a brief overview of neuroanatomy that on the medial surface the pyramidal cells that innervate lower limbs are located and on the lateral surface the pyramidal cells that supply upper motor neuron supply to uh, your upper limbs is located on the lateral surface. And you can also recall that medial part of the brain is supplied by anterior cerebral artery while the lateral surface of the cerebral cortex is supplied by middle cerebral artery. So if there is a weakness of lower limb greater than weakness of upper limb it means it's a lien in the territory of anterior cerebral artery and if there is greater weakness in upper limb as compared to lower limb it means most likely it's in the territory of middle cerebral artery. Moreover because Broca's area and Wernick's area are located on the lateral surface so motor or sensory aphasia also point towards the involvement of middle cerebral artery. So just to sum up these, this discussion of hemiplegia, in case of hemiplegia the first thing that you need to know is, is it crossed hemiplegia or uncrossed hemiplegia? Crossed hemiplegia means lien is at the level of brain stem. Uncrossed hemiplegia means lien is above the level of brain stem. So above the level of brain stem it can be internal capsule or cerebral cortex and based on cortical dysfunction we can differentiate between these two liens. So the purpose of this educational video was to give you a fundamental knowledge of localization of lien. It does not cover every aspect of localization of lien but with this knowledge in mind you can expand your knowledge and you can go into further details. Keep on watching and do give us your feedback.